Secretary Dinky, Dean Ed Gonzalez, my distinguished fellow speakers, fellow ASEAN and Filipino advocates for social and solidarity economy. Magandang umaga po sa ating lahat. My, uh, my part here, being the last uh, speaker for the morning, uh, is to try to put into context, I guess, the various uh, talks so far, and in particular, the, uh, the, the, the exposition by Mr. Utting on social uh, solidarity economy in the context of the ASEAN, and of course, in the Philippines. I think we all know that our main challenge right now is the lack of inclusive growth. And therefore, our inclusive development, in fact, I should say, which ought to be the more important objective of all of us. Now, to put it into perspective in the ASEAN, there has always been the need for more inclusive growth. I, am, uh, I, 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 I was happy with that picture that Secretary Dinky showed of the difference between ec ec uh, equality and equity. And in a sense, you can see that lack of equity in this diagram. The left pie chart shows the respective shares of the population in ASEAN, of the different ASEAN countries. On the right is the respective shares in income, as measured by GDP. Of course, the biggest slice of population is Indonesia, but it's not necessarily the biggest slice in terms of income. What's perhaps quite uh, remarkable is that the biggest, one of the biggest slices in income is Singapore, and yet it's just a tiny sliver on the left pie chart. Well, uh, the Philippines, for example, which is the light blue on the, on the uh, southwestern part of the diagram. Again, you can see we have a big chunk of the population, not a very, not, not a very significant part of the income. So in short, ASEAN's great natural diversity, even if you're just looking at uh, populations, is not mirrored in the diversity or the compositions of uh, socioeconomic patterns as measured here by income. So there is, I hope, some sense of the non-inclusiveness of the development that we have seen in ASEAN so far. Well, here's another diagram which shows poverty incidence in the various ASEAN, not, not all, but some of the ASEAN countries. Thank you. And you can see, for example, how poverty incidence is very low in Thailand, Malaysia, but very high in some of the uh, other countries, including the Philippines being among the higher ones. Again, there's a great deal of divergence in terms of poverty incidence. And this is, by the way, measured according to the $1 as of 2002, the, the red uh, bar, and $1.25 by 2008, when they had to adjust that international poverty line for inflation. Well, in the Philippines, I guess one way to say that our growth has always been non-inclusive is via the three adjectives I have liked to use over the years to describe the kind of economic growth and development that we have been getting. It has been narrow, shallow, and hollow. Narrow because our economy and our economic growth has been dominated by a few leading sectors, and often we hear about business process outsourcing or BPOs, real estate, the financial uh, services industry, are, they, are the ones really that had the highest growth rates in our economy. Geographic areas, I refer to the fact that Metro Manila and the surrounding provinces of regions three and four already comprise two-thirds of the GDP or the total incomes and output of the Philippine economy. I also call it shallow because the, the fast-growing industries in the Philippines are very weakly linked, if at all, to other industries in the economy. Just to give an illustration of that, let me have a little bit of audience participation here. What is our, the Philippines' number one export product? Yell it out. Well, aside, next to people. You're right, people is. <laughs> but commodity export. Electronics, actually, is the number one. But what's our number one import? No, it's also electronics. Now, what does that tell you? Well, our electronics industry, which is our number one export, which is about, again, two-thirds of our total export revenues, only has a very thin slice of domestic value added. Only the assembly labor is what benefits from it, but hardly any other industry in the country is linked to that uh, industry. Similarly with garments, by the way. Anyway, 
there is very little linkage to the rest of the economy, so these fast-growing industries don't really benefit much of the rest of the Philippine economy. Follow, the, the, the third adjective, of course, is hollow, and this is encapsulated in the common term we hear nowadays, jobless growth. Sometimes in the Philippines, it feels like job-killing growth, where the growth of the GDP zooms up, and then the, the, employment, the unemployment rate, in fact, goes up, or the employment rate goes down. So again, this is the kind of uh, growth that does not lead to widespread welfare. So again, I call that hollow growth. This, I guess, is the manifestation of this lack of inclusive growth in the Philippines. Now, in the Philippines, we have essentially taken four pathways to inclusive growth and inclusive development in general. One of them, and I, I feel very strongly about it, is small and medium enterprise development. Too much of our GDP, an estimated 60% at least, is coming from large enterprises and consequently also a few large families. Uh, we have to level the playing field for large enterprises and small and medium enterprises. An another important element in the pathways to inclusive growth in the Philippines is the now pending in Congress competition policy law, which would in effect uh, prohibit trusts and monopolies it will curb unfair trade practices, and again, it will regulate inevitable monopolies, what the economists call natural monopolies. A third and very important pathway has been asset reform, the most well-known being agrarian reform, but we also have in the Philippines the fisheries code to address the plight of the poor coastal fisher folks, and then the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act to address the plight of the indigenous peoples in the uplands, and the Urban Development and Housing Act, which is for urban poor. And then, the economic approach is to look at what sectors or industries in the Philippine economy would have the strongest labor employment uh, generation, and number two, have the strongest inter-industry linkages, so that you have broad-based benefits from the growth of these industries. And a technical analysis of the so-called input-output table of the Philippine economy, which I did some time back, logically points to, not surprisingly, agriculture, tourism, and manufacturing as key industries or sectors that, whose growth will in fact have more broad-based benefits. So that's pursuing inclusive growth in the Philippines as far as our uh, standard development approach uh, actually is in effect, uh, charting through our Philippine development plan, among other things. Let me look at the ASEAN. ASEAN seeks to pursue more inclusive growth, and by, by this we mean more, in, more equitable both across the ASEAN member countries and within each individual ASEAN member country by widening and strengthening the interlinkages among the ASEAN countries and again within the ASEAN countries. And here we talk about four types of linkages, institutional linkages, and right now in the ASEAN plan of action, it is through the so-called initiative for ASEAN integration, which is really a mechanism for uh, compensating the, the, the more affluent or the more advanced ASEAN countries being able to compensate the weaker ones, usually the so-called CLMB countries, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam. But as an aside, I'd like to say that often it feels like the, the, the least are really CLMP, because Vietnam is already ahead of the Philippines in many ways. Now, on the infrastructure, again, infrastructure itself is being used to link together the ASEAN countries to have more uh, inclusive development. And here, there's very deliberate efforts across the ASEAN in connecting us via transport facilities, whether by land, by air, and by water. Uh, we in the Philippines are particularly disadvantaged. We are sort of detached and separated from wa by water from most of the rest of ASEAN. So we can only advocate for the ASEAN roll-on, roll-off network as our way to also get uh, into this interlinkage via infrastructure. And then, of course, the economic linkage, which is the most prominent, the so-called ASEAN Economic Community, or AEC 2015, which a lot of, men a lot of people seem to be worried about worried about, but this is really going to uh, be uh, pursued through f closer interdependencies, especially through strategic regional value chains. Now, I don't have the time to elaborate on that, but one of the quite noteworthy observations about ASEAN integration economically 
is that we are not anymore competing in terms of uh, trade in goods that we all produce. Instead, we are trading in products that all belong to the same industry because m much of the countries of ASEAN are part of a value chain wherein, for example, the Philippines exports motor vehicle components to Thailand and Thailand assembles the motor vehicles and exports it to the rest of ASEAN. Philippines also assembles a lot of the electronic circuit boards which are further assembled into finished products somewhere else and many of, most of them also in uh, other parts of ASEAN. In short, it's a value chain linkage in the trade relationships. It's no longer a competition, it's a complementation.